June 14th, man, we got kids ministry back. And listen, come early. We're going to have coffee and donuts. Now, look, I know some of you are loving that, coffee and donuts. And then afterwards, about 12, 15, or right after the service, we're going to have the food trucks out there. We've got several food trucks. We've got sliders. We've got pizza. We've got tacos. We've got snow cones. So we're going to have some tables set up, have some tables set up out there. And it's going to be a good time just celebrating how good God is. Give him praise again. Amen. Amen. Turn over to Judges chapter 17. I want to talk to you today about the real deal. Has anyone ever had the, heard the phrase, man, he's the real deal, or she is the real deal? And what that phrase means when somebody says they're the real deal, it means what you see is what you get. In other words, they're the same as you see them here as they are by themselves or in a group. It doesn't matter. They, they are who they are. They're the real deal. They're not fake. They're not false. Uh, they're not putting on a front. They're the same whether they're in public or they're in private. And listen, we need to be the real deal. We need to be the real deal. And um, uh, I was thinking about this. Listen, God is the real deal. I want a real relationship with him. I want the real deal. I don't want a false relationship with him. I don't want an imitation relationship with him. I want to have the real deal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to share this with you as I was uh, preparing. I was thinking about this familiar scripture here, Psalm 133, 1. And it's a, uh, a passage about unity and how there's a blessing in that. In other words, when we are the real deal. It says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And listen, when it says brethren, it's talking about the body of Christ. But look, let me tell you this. God desires that all men come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he wants all people to be in the, the, the brotherhood, if you will, the, in the family of God and to be in unity. And it says this about the unity when we are together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. In other words, an anointing. There's God's favor. There's God's blessing there when there's unity. And it goes on and says this in verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountain of Zion, the dew. What does dew do? What does dew do? What does dew do? It waters the earth. It brings forth something. It produces something. So when there's unity, there's an anointing, and there's prosperity, and there's blessings in that. And it goes on to say, for God, the Lord commanded the blessing, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Where? Where there's unity. And I was looking up this word unity, and it's, it's from the word yachad, the word unity. And I think it's so appropriate for where we're at in our culture, in our nation right now. Listen to what it was talking about. When it's talking about being in unity, it means this, all together. To be all together, encouraging and learning, to gather together as, as believers, as the body of Christ, to come together. But it means this, it means all together, and it means alike. Everybody say alike. And if you look around, we're not all alike. So it's not talking that we all, about that we all need to dress the same, look the same, same skin color, and be alike in that manner. It's talking about this, the same attitudes towards God and towards people. We're to be alike in that. We're to be in unity in that. So all together, to be alike, and listen to this, to be aligned. All together, alike and aligned. Aligned with God's precepts and God's principles. Not man-made precepts, man-made uh, ideas, but God's principles, His law. That's what He desires for us to be like. And when we're like that, there's blessings in that. How many of you want to be blessed? I know that I do. So He said there's blessings in that. And let me tell you, that we hear the, the, the term, and a lot of times you see this whenever you look up a church website, you're trying to find out what kind of church it is. It says authentic worship. Right? You ever heard, heard that? And I think I've heard that phrase before. I thought, what does that really mean? Authentic. It means real. It means the real deal. Genuine. And we all like authentic. We like genuine. How many of you like authentic Mexican food? Come on. No imitation. Authentic. We want real. We want the real deal. We want authentic Nothing false, nothing imitation. We want to be the same. And listen, Paul desires this same thing for the church. And remember, Paul, he's the overseer. 
the, uh, of the churches, and he's, he's telling this, and he's encouraging them, look, guys, I want you to be the real deal. As overseer, it brings me pleasure, Paul says, for you to be the real deal. I'm paraphrasing, but here's what he says in Philippians 2.1. He says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, in other words, being being in the body of Christ, if it matters at all, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, he says this, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, being the same. Having the same uh, attitudes towards God, towards people, towards his principles. Having the same love. Being of one accord. Being of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness, humility, same of mind. Let each, listen to this, esteem others, not just, not just equal, higher than yourself. Higher than yourself. So he's saying, look, let's be the real deal. He's pleading with them. Father, we come to you this morning. And Father, we just we lift up our nation. We lift up, Father, ourselves that we are the real deal, Father. We pray for the elimination of division. The enemy has been trying from day one to bring division. And Father, we bind it in the name of Jesus. And Father, we all have opinions and thoughts. But Father, I pray that you help us work on ourselves to be the real deal. Father, to speak up when we see something that's not the real deal. But Father, let us be authentic and genuine. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. People want the real deal. Let me ask you this. How many of you like genuine leather? I went look for, looking for a belt recently, and I looked for a belt, and I, I would turn them over and say synthetic, man-made material, all this stuff. But I was looking for the one that says genuine leather. Come on, can I, you know, I, I wanted the real deal. Now, there's a lot of great synthetics out there now, but I wanted something that was authentic because we all want real, the real deal. We want uh, authentic things. And uh, there was a time a while back I was looking for a good quality pair of headphones. I go to the gym, I work out, and I can hear other things around me. I wanted something that has noise cancellation, that cancels cancel out other noise, and I could just hear what I wanted to hear, and I wanted something. And when you go look at headphones, you can spend some money on some headphones. And they had certain brands out there that, that were $300 and more, and can I just tell you, I don't want to spend $300 on a pair of headphones. But I wanted a good quality pair of headphones. I wanted something real. And, and so I actually ended up buying this pair. And I actually have a picture of them here. Buying this pair of headphones that, that, that was a good quality. Does anybody recognize the brand of these headphones? Anybody at all? It's Beach, you said. Well, I got news for you. It looks like it, but it is not. Because I the Beats headphones are like three hundred dollars. I said I'm not doing that. So I found a pair for fourteen dollars that seemed just fine, and I got a magic marker, a black marker, and I made it look like the Beats headphones. Look, there's the real deal. Do y'all see the difference? My point is this, that sometimes we can look like the real deal, but when you get close enough, you see, wait a minute, it's just an imitation. It's false. It's not the real deal. When it comes to a relationship with God, I don't want something that looks real from a distance. I want the real deal. Come on. I want the real deal because that's what we all want, the real deal. I was thinking about this too is that, uh, I have been riding motorcycles since I could ride motorcycles. I love riding motorcycles. I've been riding Harley Davidsons for quite a while. Uh, I like them. And, you know, there's a certain persona that comes with this biker attitude. You know, there's actually a thing called the one percenters. They're, they're supposed to be the, they're the baddest of the bad dudes. In other words, they're saying, I'm not the 99% that's good. I'm the one percent that's bad. I am not a one percenter. At most, I'm a two percenter. I'm going to get a gallon of milk picture uh, sewn on my patch with a gallon of milk that says 2%. Come on, somebody. 2% milk is what I drink. But, you know, so, but I have this alter ego. And so uh, and I'm not really a biker, but I like, I mean, as you would think, a biker. But I had this, look, I got this one day. Look, check it out. So I got this. So when I go riding my bike, I really, truly look like a biker now, see? So like, look at this picture. See there? That, uh, that's a biker. That looks like the real deal, although I'm not. I mean, I'm a real biker. You know what I mean. But sometimes, see, look at this. See, you just want to look the part sometimes. 
alter ego, you know? Rev, see, I'm a reverend. Rev, there you go. So the rev, it's the alter ego that you have. I want to look the part. So there's a guy named Micah, not the prophet Micah, but in Judges 17, there's a guy named Micah that he looks like the real deal, but he's not the real deal. He wanted to, to have what seemed to be the real deal, but he did, didn't want to give what it takes to have the real deal, relationship with God. Here's a guy, Micah, that we'll see that he had a relationship with God that looked real. He, we actually find him where he's returning stolen property to his mother. He stole some money, quite a bit of money, a life savings worth of money, back to his mother that he had stolen from his mother. He had stolen it. His mom didn't know he had stolen it. And his mom was placing a curse on whoever stole her money. And he's in the room hearing her do that. And he's getting to thinking, well, man, that's a curse on me. I don't want that. So he goes back to his, to his mom and says, hey, mom, you let money that was taken from you? <laughs> I took it. Here it is. I'm giving it back. And then she ends up blessing him. You know, and he creates this shrine. She gives him some of this money to say, look, I want to create a, uh, an image, a, a molded image, which is against the law of God. And he creates this fake, false place of worship. And can I just say, I don't want a false place of worship in my life. I want the real deal. Amen. And at this time in society, there was, there was no spiritual guidance or none that they submitted to. There was political chaos and all these things going on and, and social disorder. And it's a lot like what we see now. No king in the land and the people did what they wanted to do that was right in their own eyes. A lot like us today in general. So look at Judges 7, verse, 17, verse 1. It says this. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, in other words, I heard you say it, here's the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, you, uh, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So he ends up giving it back to his mother, and she blesses, blesses him. But here's my first point. If we want the real deal, then let's have a clear conscience. I, I believe we, we might say that his conscience began to bother him, and he didn't want the curse. He wanted to be blessed. But he goes and he clears the matter up, so to speak, and he gives it to his mom. I think if we want to have the real deal, we need to make sure there's nothing in our life that is clouding our relationship with God. Let's clear the slate. Let's have a clear conscience. Let's repent of it. This was a large sum of money that he had taken, and he just couldn't take it anymore. And perhaps uh, Proverbs 15, 16 applies here. It says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Amen? Better is to live the right way with the Lord than to create trouble for myself. And let's clear the slate. Let's have a clear conscience. You know, there's quite a bit to be said in, in, the, in the scriptures about our conscience. And when I think of our conscience, if we want to be real with God, let's have a clear conscience. In other words, let's not have any barriers in the way of allowing God to speak to our conscience, to our inner man, to our spirit being. Let's don't have anything in the way that would create a barrier for him to speak clearly to us and for us to listen to him. I think of the story of the woman that was caught in adultery along with a man, but they brought the woman, right? In the very act, it says, and they brought her to Jesus because they wanted him to stone her and, and, and admit that she needed to be stoned. But instead, he kneels down and he begins to write in the sand something. We don't know what he wrote. But it says that they were all convicted in their conscience, and they began one by one to walk away. In other words, they saw, you know what, there's things in my own life that's not right, and their conscience began to reveal it to them, and they walked away. And Jesus said, they don't condemn, we're your accusers. They don't condemn you, and neither do I. But our conscience leads us. And, and you know, you've heard the statement, let your conscience be your guide. Listen to Romans 2.14. It says this, it says, for when Gentiles, and it's talking about people that they don't have a relationship with God. They don't have God's spirit inside of them. They don't have the law to go by and, and use that as their guide. They're non-believers. They're Gentiles. It says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law. In other words, they don't have the written law, but by, by their natural instincts, they do the things that are right. Why? Because their consciences tell them, don't do this and do that. 
do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. In other words, they're able to self-govern themselves by what their conscience is telling them. Let's don't allow our conscience to be silenced or seared. Let's allow God to speak to the Holy, the Holy Spirit, to speak to our inner man, our spirit being, and let's be led by the Spirit of God. It says this, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and being between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them. In other words, is it, should I do this? Should I not do that? They're listening to the voice of God inside of them. If we want to have the real deal relationship with God, let's make sure that we have a clear conscience before God. In other words, let's keep the communication line open with God. And not allow anything to hinder that in our lives. Listening to the Holy Spirit. Paul says this in Romans 9, 1. He says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Listen, I, people say this all the time. I can't hear God. I can't hear God. But I would, I would venture to say that all of us have had moments in our life where I, I just feel like I should do this. I feel like I should call this person. I don't feel that I should do that. Can I just tell you that God uses that part of your being, that, that inner man, that, that spirit being in you to speak to you? And I believe this is what happens. When we hear that and we obey that, I believe it becomes louder and louder and louder. But when we suppress that and we ignore it and we do what we want to do in our own eyes and our own mind, our own thoughts, our own flesh, then I believe it gets quieter and quieter and quieter. So if we want to have a clear conscience, let's listen and obey to what he says to us. Amen? Listen and obey. Don't ignore it. 1 Timothy 1.18 says this. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Here's what he's saying. Look, let, let God lead through your conscience, through your spirit. He says some have had a life, their life is a shipwreck because they have ignored it. Let's don't ignore it. And let's, let's listen to the Holy Spirit. Yield to it. You know, I was thinking about this. and The voice of the Holy Spirit to me and the voice of Ava sound a lot alike. <laughs> a whole lot alike. What I mean by this, sometimes Ava may suggest something. Hey, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. And I'll say, no, I don't think so. But then God will start speaking to me and saying the same thing that Ava said. And now I have a choice to make. Do I obey that or not? You know, I have to, I have to be willing to, to put my pride aside and, and not allow my conscience to be. See, there's lots of reasons that we ignore. I mean, not because of what somebody else. It may be just something, I want to do this and I want to do it now and I want to do what I want to do and that's the end of it. When we allow that type of attitude to lead and guide us, our conscience becomes seared. Anybody ever burns your finger on a hot stove or something like that, and you get this callus or this, this burnt place, a, a, a scar, a seared spot, your nerves, or you can't feel much? That's what happens to our spirit when we ignore the voice of God. When we ignore the voice of God, we're resisted. It's, 1 Timothy 4.1 says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, here we are in, in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. We're seeing that now all over the place. From, the, from this time till now, it's been happening. We're listening to other voices uh, and doctrines of demons, it says. Things that are against God's principles and precepts. And it says this, speaking lies and hypocrisy. And when we do that, it says having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, that's an illustration there. Like a hot iron is searing our spiritual conscience when we give in to other things other than God's voice. So let's, if we want to have a real deal, authentic relationship with God, then let's listen to the voice of God. I want to share this with you. I was talking about Ava, and, and uh, uh, yesterday at men's breakfast, by the way, I think we had 35, 40 men yesterday at men's breakfast, and one, how many? 29, 30, 29, uh, close to 30. We had 29 men here at men's breakfast yesterday, and uh, Juan Cristalis was speaking, and he said this. This is free, so on your notes, put it aside, because it's not part of my message, but I thought you had to hear this. He said this. He said, uh, Juan Cristalis said, if a woman does not put up with your crap, 
then she, she's probably the right woman for you. Come on now. That's good stuff right there. That's good stuff right there. You know, I'm going to use this four or five times and I'm going to call it my own, but I thought that was really good. But a seared conscience does not hear from God. We've got to be willing to do what the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, says to us so that we keep that conscience, that communication line open. So listen to Judges 17.3. Uh, Here's what happened. So he returned the money, and his mom said, oh, he, she blessed him after that. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had holy. Listen to what she said. I've holy. Everybody say holy. Not holy, like holy to God, but, but completely. I have 100% Holy, completely dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord my, for my son to make a carved image and a, and a uh, molded image. Now, therefore, which is against the law, by the way, of God, I will return it to you. Thus, he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took, listen to this, his mother took 200. Now, how much did she say that she wholly committed? 1,100. But then when she got it back, what did she do? Gave him 200. You know, there's a little bit of dishonesty there or not genuineness. Not, not the real deal. I'm thinking, how did he learn to be the man that he was? Probably from home. We learn a lot of things from home, amen? To make a carved image and a molded image, now therefore I will return it to you. Thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image. And they were in, listen to this, the house of Micah. Point number two is this. Avoid little idols avoid little idols if we want to have a real deal authentic relationship with god let's avoid little idols he took these idols and he made a shrine his own little personal temple a, a miniature version of the real deal listen to this in, in verse five the man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols household idols and he consecrated one of his sons, one of his own sons, who became his priest. In those days, there, were no, was the, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Here's what he's doing. He's taking what his mother had given him and making these idols and creating his own version of a, a place of worship. It's not the real deal. It's a false place of worship. He's taken one of his... Listen, there's a real temple and there's real priests and there's real worship. What is he doing? He's living by his own rules and his own standards and creating his own little religion in his own house, his own shrine, and living by his own rules. Let's don't create little idols and put them ahead of God. And I thought about this where it says he had household idols. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't have little idols sitting around in my house miniature versions of, of something, to, to, uh, figurines or something to worship. But let me just tell you this. I, I really want to be real with God and say, God, is there anything in my household or in my life or in my heart that I have placed as an idol above you that I give more attention to than I should, that is out of order, out of whack in my life? Lord, if it is, Speak to me, speak to my spirit and help me adjust things and put them back in the right order that they need to be. And let me tell you this, don't, when I say don't create little idols, don't, don't reduce God to a little idol. He's much bigger than that. Come on. He can do much bigger than we can even think or imagine. You know, when you think of a, a false place of worship here, the worship means to adore something that we adore, adoration. You, 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 you put it on a pedestal. Make sure that we're removing anything that takes the place of God. And I also had a little play of words here. Idol worship. I-D-O-L. Idol, a figure, an idol. Something you worship. But what about this? Lord, do I have idol worship? I-D-L-E. In other words, slow-moving lazy worship. Lord, don't let me have idol worship. Let me have an energetic, passionate worship, genuine, real deal towards you. Would you give him praise? Come on. A real worship towards him. 
So don't reduce him to a little idol. He's much greater than that. You know, Job, Job said that, he says, will you contend with God? In other words, how can we, and I thought about this, how can man, and man's been trying to do this for years, how can man who God Almighty created, create an image that even remotely represents God? Come on. He's much bigger than we give him credit for often. So let's have the real deal. The third and last point is this. Don't accept an imitation. This was an imitation place of worship. It wasn't the real deal. It had some resemblance of the real, but it wasn't the real. I thought about this uh, when I was studying this, too. Is Years ago, Abe and I went to New York. And it was our first time we went to New York at that time. And uh, we went to this place where you can buy all kinds of things. And I went to this one place, this jeweler. And uh, I went in there, and they had a Rolex watch that was really priced real cheap. And I thought, man, that's a great deal. And uh, so now I'll tell you, it wasn't a real Rolex, but it looked real. It was $45. Come on. And I thought, man, that's an awesome deal. And it looks real. So I thought to myself, man, I, I want this. So I got it. It was nice. And, you know, a Rolex has like that perpetual movement where you can't see it ticking. It just kind of moves right. It was almost like that. I thought, man, this is a good replica. So I got it, and it had a black face, kind of like this watch here. This is not a Rolex, by the way, but it had a, a black face on it, a silver band like this one. And I thought, man, that's so cool. So I got it, gave me 45 bucks for it. So I thought, I want to go compare it to the real deal. I want to go see what it looks like. So I went to the expensive part of town, and we went into this place and saw Rolex. I didn't have it on. I actually put it in my pocket because I didn't want them to see me with it. Well, I put it in my pocket, and I asked the guy, it was, I think it was a submariner or something like that, so I said, can I see your submariner? So he showed him to me, and I was looking for one that resembled the one I just bought that had the black face on it, and I, I saw a silver face. I said, there, that watch right there, I said, do you, and I wanted to see how much it was. I said, do you have that one with a black face? He says, uh, no, sir, that watch is not made with a black face. I went, you're kidding me. I just got took. I didn't say that out loud, but I'm thinking that. I thought I had something, but it wasn't, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't even look like the real deal that I thought it would look like. But you know, I, actually, that's illegal to produce replicas that look like that. So my conscience started bothering me. So I had to watch it. Not only that, I was thinking, you know, I really bought it for the wrong motive, wrong reasons and all that. So I, was, I didn't even want to wear it anymore. So I got rid of it. I gave it to my brother-in-law, Mark Youngworth, and he still has it. He has no conscience. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so there was another time I went, no he does, I'm just kidding so, anyway. so I go to uh, Cozumel we're on a cruise, we stop in Cozumel I like cowboy boots, so I go in this shop and they have these boots, they got all kinds of exotic boots, they had these Cayman Crocodile chocolate boots I thought, man, those are so nice and the price was right, 200 bucks I thought, man, things are cheap over here in Mexico. This, this place it came in crocodile boots. So I asked the guy, I said, are you sure these are real? He said, yes, sir, they're authentic. They're the real deal. They're came in crocodile. So I took his word for it. So I got him on the ship. I got back to Texas. I went to, I called up a guy. I was just still curious. And I went to a place. I said, are these real came in crocodiles? He didn't even touch them. He said, no. I said, what? What do you mean, no? So he started showing me how he could tell because he knew his stuff, you know. I got took again. Come on. It wasn't the real deal. It looked like the real deal. Uh, so I gave it, I sold him to Mark for $400. And <clears throat> no, no, I didn't. He's not even here. He was, anyway. But, uh. But I actually bought the insurance on the cruise line where you can get it back, so I got my money back. Somebody praise God that I got my money back on that. But here's the thing. Don't accept an imitation. Micah's shrine, you know, you know scholars say that most likely, and they don't know for sure, but the, the images that he created, had made, were probably and could have been miniature replicas of the real deal, of the Ark of the Covenant, things that were in the temple, the the table for the showbread, things, creating his own little space of worship that looked like the real deal but wasn't the real deal, an imitation of the real temple. And it, it may look like the real deal, but it wasn't the real deal. Remember, he made his son, one of, the, one of his sons, a priest for him. But look what happened in verse 7. Don't accept an imitation. His son was not of the lineage of the Levites, who, which was the tribe that the priests came from, but he made his son priest anyway. But when you look at verse 7, it says, Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, 
he was a Levite. In other words, he's from the tribe that the priests come from. And was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. He's out wandering around looking for a place to stay. This Levite of the priesthood was looking for a place to stay. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah's like, he's, he's excited. And said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you, listen to this, 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. In other words, the deal was made, and he agreed. But did y'all notice something there? He gave him 10 shekels per year. How much did he steal from his mom? 1,100 shekels. Do y'all see how much money he took from his mom? If 1,100 was a good for a year's wages plus you know, room and board and um, uh, stuff like that, he cheated it. Boy, he took a lot from his mom. But here Micah is, he wants the real deal so bad, he has an invitation, he makes a son priest, all of a sudden a guy from the priesthood, the lineage of the Levites comes up and he says, hey, you be my priest. He's trying his best to create a place of worship, but it's not the real deal. He's living by his own rules, his own ideas. Uh, it's false. He had established an imitation of what is real and it was governed, listen to this, by his own rules and he had his own priest. God, don't let us create our own worship. Come on. That's not real. What we think is real. Father, let us have a genuine, authentic, real deal relationship and a worship with you and of you. Give him praise for that. Don't accept an imitation. Don't accept an imitation. We, we've heard the phrase, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks, must be a what? No, not all the time. We can be fooled. Judges 17, 13, look at this. Then Micah said, because he's got the priest now, he's had his son in the role of a priest, but now he's got a genuine Levite of the lineage of the priest, right? And look what he says here. He says, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. You know, sometimes we try to justify, we try to validate our own actions and say, well, that's good enough. But what we really need to be saying is, God, what do you say is good enough for me and my life and worship towards you? Let's don't settle for an imitation. But let's make sure that we have the real deal. It was his own religion, his own, uh, hired his own um, uh, Levite. And, you know, I had an interesting thought here, too. Notice this Levite who had come from Judah in Bethlehem. In other words, there's a temple, a real deal place of worship that people are supposed to come to worship where the Levites are supposed to be serving, and that was their role, their job. But here's a Levite that's supposed to be over here in the real deal temple. He's out wandering around looking for a place to work. He's out wandering around, and I, and I just had this thought. Was it so bad in the culture of that time that people did what they want, that they neglected even going to the church where the, the, the Levite had to go find something else to do or somebody else to, to minister to. Lord, don't let us get to that place, but let us maintain and keep the real deal worship in relationship with you. Amen. And I want to share this with you too. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see, we can do what we think is right. And I believe Micah, he was probably doing what he thought was right. Maybe. But there's a way that seems right to us. Maybe we're doing what we think is right. But what we need to do is say, we need to stop and say, Lord, what am I doing that's not pleasing to you? Lord, do I have a heart that is not open to you? Is my conscience so clouded with other things? Is it seared that I can't hear from you, Lord? Do I have little idols, little things that I give so much attention and value to that it takes the place of what I need to be, of my time that needs to be given to you? Am I settling for things that aren't real? Lord, let me have the real deal. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we come to you this morning with a desire for the real deal, the real 
authentic relationship with you. Father, I pray for each one of us that we have a clear conscience, Father. Father, that we remove anything that causes our conscience to be seared, things that we're hanging on to where we're being disobedient and not listening to you, not yielding to you. But, Father, let us yield to you. Let us not have a seared conscience, Father. Let us have an open heart that, that listens to you, ears that hear, Father, eyes that see what you want for us. And, Father, I pray that you help us, Father. Father, when we read things like this, idols, Father, we may not have statues and things that we're literally bowing down to and worship, but Father, in our household, but Father, in our hearts and our lives, if there's anything that we're giving more attention than we need to, to, and Father, that, that's taking the place of you, and Father, robbing us of our time, and causing us to neglect you, Father, I pray that you reveal it to us, and that we remove it, Father. And Father, that we do not reduce you to a little idol, Father. That we recognize how great you are. And that we not settle for an imitation. Father, that we have genuine, authentic relationships, Father, with you. And Father, that people that are looking for genuineness see it in us. Father, that we're the same in public as we are in private, Father in private and public, Father, that, that what you see is what you get, that we are the real deal, Father, that you shape us and mold us who you want us to be. And we give you praise for that. Every head bowed and eyes closed. A clear conscience. You know, with the day of Pentecost, Peter was speaking to the people. They were confused about what was going on. He's sharing with them what had happened. He's given a recount of everything that had happened and how Jesus was crucified. And he was a son of God. And people began to be convicted in their hearts and their conscience and their hearts. And they asked Peter, what must we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent. You know, when Micah was convicted in his heart or in fear of what his mom had said, he he repented in a sense. He 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 gave back to his mom what he had stolen. He he cleaned the slate, in other words, cleared his conscience. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Peter said, "Repent." In other words, come and Jesus takes away, wipes away your sins, makes the slate clean, gives you a clear conscience. If you're here this morning, you say, "You know what? I want the real deal." I believe a lot of people avoid coming to church and accepting Jesus Christ because they have seen people that consider themselves to be the real deal, but they're false and they, they, they leave a bad taste in other people's mouths. They say, I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't go to church or believe in Christ because of this. Somebody misrepresented who Christ is. But if you're here and you say, you know what, I want the real deal. Look to Christ. He's the real deal. Maybe you've been confused. Maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ and actually had conversations this week with people that they've been confused. Things happen in their lives and they begin to question things. And, is this real? Is this real? Is God real? Maybe that's you and you say, you know what? I, I want the real deal. I want to come back into a real relationship with him. So if you're here and you say, Pastor Ron, I want the real deal. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to come back into a real relationship with him. And I want to pray for you this morning. If that's you with every hand bowed and eyes closed, would you lift your hand so I can see it? I want to pray with you right where you are for the real deal. Say, so, Pastor, that's me. Hallelujah. I want to accept Jesus. I want to come back into a real right relationship with him. Hallelujah. I don't see any hands, but I like to hug. There you go. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's all say this prayer together. Say, Father God. I believe with all my heart that you are the real deal, that you exist, and that you love me. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross and pay for my sins. I thank you for your forgiveness, and I repent of all my sins. I thank you that because of your grace, I am forgiven. I'm your child. I am the real deal. I'm your child. Help me from this day forward to hear your voice and to walk in your ways. 
In the name of Jesus. Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. God bless you.